Hello Booktuber, my name is Elizabeth. Welcome or welcome back to my channel, Book As In Books. This video is a mid-month wrap-up. Um, yeah, it's a mid-month wrap-up where I'm going to talk about the books that I've read in June and the ones that I am still reading. It's been 10, 12 days since I filmed a video and the reason is that the beginning of the month was not very... Well, was that the best for me, uh, book-wise, reading-wise? It was disappointing. I think so far that's uh, the... it sums up very well the month of June for me in reading. Disappointing. Um, it started by me not being selected for the Booktube Prize. I was disappointed for that. Uh, then I started a book that I didn't like. I DNF'd it. And then... Um, and then I read a couple of books that I finished and I found them disappointing. And um, yeah, so, so th this video will be, I think I will start with the disappointing books and then I will continue with the current reads and then I will end with uh, books, books that I finished that were not disappointing, uh, but that I don't have much to talk about. So uh, yeah, th that's going to be the structure of this video. So the first couple of books that I read that were disappointing. Uh, the first one is The Groundbreaking, An American City and Its Search for Justice by Scott Ellsworth. Uh, this book is for the is in the semi-finals of the Booktube Prize, and that's the reason why I decided to read it. I decided to tag along, even though I was not a judge. But since I'm not a judge, I can say what I thought of it. And I was disappointed. So this book is about is somewhat about the Tulsa race riots of 1921. So what's happened in 1921 is basically that uh, there was about to be a lynching of a black man and the black community, well some members of the black community in Tulsa, decided to protect that man, that young man, he was a teenager. And of course uh, a part of the white community decided to take it as an offense and decided to take revenge upon the black people who had resisted. So basically, it was what they called at the time a race riot. It's basically when the white part of town goes down in the black part of the, t of the town and destroys everything. And that's what happened. But in the particular case of Tulsa, it was more than just the mob. It was the state too. Uh, because apparently the, the National Guard, or the, the state level National Guard participated in that too. There were machine guns involved. There were planes involved. Uh, planes dropping bombs and shooting. So um, it, it was it was what we call now today a massacre. It was more than a race riot. But the other particular thing about the 1921 race riots of uh, of Tulsa is that all traces of it were destroyed, or, or almost. Uh, the next day, or in the following days, the police went around and seized every picture that they could find of the events. Um, in the national archives, in the state archives, in, in the archives, um, the, the first page of the newspapers of the time were ripped. They, they simply don't exist anymore. So there was a lot of things that were hidden about this uh, race riot, this massacre. And the author, Scott Ellsworth, is one of the people who sort of brought it to light um, in the 1970s. That was when he was a student and he was studying that particular aspect of um, the Tulsa. He was trying to figure out what happened in Tulsa in 1921 and he searched for all the archives. Now, at the time, he wrote a book, or I think it was published in the 1980s. So there's already a book about the 1921 race riots written by Scott Ellsworth. So that's not what he's trying to do in this book. In this book, he wants to write about the search for the mass graves, because to this day, we still don't know exactly how many people died in these events, in these few days in 1921. And one of the clues could be if we found the places where the bodies were buried, because there's ample testimony, verbal testimony. Um, and there used to be, once upon a time, somebody saw a picture of a mass grave. So th there are reasons to believe that there are mass graves of victims of the Tulsa race riots. And this is supposed to be about the search for them. I said supposed to be about that because the topic arrives quite late in the book. Uh, we spent a lot of time before that on other topics. Uh, well, of course, there's a one chapter about the race riots and what happened at the time, uh, a few chapters on how the evidence was hidden, a few chapters on how the author became interested in the in that story, and only towards the middle of the book does it start really to be about the search for the graves and how how people resist finding the truth, how some people want things to just stay as they are, uh, basically what we don't know doesn't hurt, or let's move on, or things like that. The problem is that, uh, well, e even though they go over all of that, 
the search for the graves are not conclusive. Uh, at the end, some search are being some searches are being done. They are of course interrupted by the uh, COVID nineteen epidemic, um, and then they start again. And then they, they they search a few things. They 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 dig in a few places, and they don't quite find what they expect to find. But we still have a book, even though there's really not much to talk about. And I think the reason simply is that it was 100 years after the race riots and the book contract said that the book had to come out 100 years after the race riots. I think that was it. I think it was a... The, the reason for the book is the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa race riots. It is not because there was something new to say about it. So it was disappointing. Um, the second disappointing book that I read, it was a book that I read a bit for Pride Month. It's Le Jardin Arc-en-Ciel by Ogawa Ito. Now, I was expecting a feel-good book because, well, the, the cover is kind of feel-good and the blurb at the back is very positive, very happy. Um, it, it says basically it's about two women uh, who find refuge in a mountain. They open a bed and breakfast and everybody is welcome. And it says the guest leaves at peace and happy. And uh, then it says, step by step, Ogawa Ito, so that's the author, uh, paints the, the picture of uh, the journey, sometimes difficult in face of intolerance and prejudice, of a family unlike others, and never stops to prove that love is the feeling, the, the emotion, whose benefits are the most powerful. Um, Yes, yeah, so, so basically it's a super positive back cover and the book that I read previously by the same author was also very feel good, very calm, very positive. So I thought, oh, this, is, this book is going to make me smile. And it didn't make me smile. I don't think it's a good book at all. Um, more than the publicity, the beginning of the book lets you believe that it's going to be one of these books where uh, problems go away because of love. Uh, it starts by a young woman who is 19, so uh, she's still going to school, I guess, high school or something, the, the equivalent in Japan. And she basically is waiting for a train just to throw herself under the train. She, she wants to commit suicide. And the, and the other woman, the older woman, sees her and decides to talk to her and invite her to dinner. And it works, um, but... Yeah, the, the, the suicidal thoughts go away just with a dinner in a good conversation. So, of course, it makes no sense. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking, it doesn't matter. It's a, it's a feel-good It's a feel -good book. It, love conquers everything. It doesn't matter. Now, uh, this young woman wanted to kill herself because she was a lesbian and her family did not accept that. And, uh, well, the, the two women see each other uh, several, the day after and the day after, and they keep seeing one another. And the older woman realizes that she is a lesbian too. The, the two women fall in love. I don't really believe in it at the beginning of the book, uh, throughout the book, because we follow the women on several years, on almost two decades. It becomes more believable afterwards. But at the beginning, I'm not really believing it. But I'm thinking, does it matter? It's a feel-good book. Just, just, just take, take it for cash. They love each other. Okay, it's fine. Um, the older woman is recently separated, and uh, she she was she didn't want to get divorced. She didn't want to sign the paper, but after she found uh, this uh, young woman and basically discovered she was a lesbian, she's all good for the divorce, and she signs the paper. And the husband just basically disappears. And I wouldn't mind, but the problem is that they have a son together. They have a six-year-old son, and the son never asks to see his father. The son never asks any questions. Um, the, the son never misses his father. It, yeah, the, the problem just magically goes away, I guess, because he loves his mother and he loves his mother's new partner. So problems go away. And so they go to live in the mountain and the son is just this perfect magic kid. He never sets a foot wrong. He listens to everyone. He always knows what to do. He's just a magic kid. So yeah, feel good book. Um, a bit of a spoiler, um, so semi-spoiler, okay, semi-spoiler. Um, the, the, the younger woman is pregnant uh, because her family didn't appreciate her being a lesbian. She tried to be with a boy to see what, it would, what would happen. She's still a lesbian, but now she's pregnant. Um, and when she learns that, the older woman gives her crap, just absolute crap, calls her a slut and things like that. And the next day, everything is forgiven. Everything is forgotten. It doesn't matter at all because of love. It goes
goes away. Okay, fine. Um, the younger woman goes to tell her parents that she is pregnant. And uh, I think it's not quite clear in the book, but under Japanese law at 19, you're still not an adult. You're still uh, a minor. So I think in theory, her parents could have kept her away or could have could have prevented her going back to this older lover. Uh, but the parents accept it uh, as long as she stay away. So basically, just don't 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 flaunt in our face the fact that you're gay, but you're allowed to be gay if you're far away. So basically, the problem goes away because of love. Uh, okay, now I'm getting into real, real spoilers. So if you if you want to read the book eventually, it's not translated in English, by the way. Um, so uh, I'm going into absolute, complete, total spoilers. So it's not semi-spoiler anymore, it's total spoilers. So we see that up to about half the books, all the problem just went away magically. At uh, more than half the book, I'd say three quarters of the book, um, we learned that the younger woman has cancer and she doesn't want to get treatment because it would reduce her life expectancy. Not quality of life, which I would understand because chemotherapy and radiotherapy, they can wreak havoc with your life and you, they can make you miserable. But it's not the quality of life that she's complaining about. It's the life expectancy, which is mathematical nonsense anyway. So because she doesn't get treated, she dies. And then the son, who is now grown up, all grown up, um, he tries to commit suicide. And the reason was that he was in love with his stepmother. And so when she dies, he decides to kill himself, but he doesn't quite succeed. So he ends up in a coma. And if he ever wakes up out of his coma, he will basically be a vegetable and he will basically be paralyzed. The end. I was super disappointed by that book. So uh, this ending has nothing to do with the happy beginning, with the, the this fluffy... I was expecting kind of in a book. I was expecting because of the cover, because of the back cover, because of the marketing, but also because at the beginning of the book, the problems just went away. So I was really expecting some feel good thing. But at the end, we get this crappy ending for two of the characters. And I did not shed a single tear because I thought, well, it's their fault. Uh, the, the woman didn't want to get treatment, uh, the boy didn't want to get help either because he knew he was depressed, he knew that the things were, were wrong. And I think it sends a message that is very, very weird and very, very wrong that if two women raise a boy together, the boy will fall in love with his stepmother. It, it, it's just ludicrous in a way. So I was very disappointed by that book. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, another disappointing book. So I started to read other stuff. Uh, thankfully, these are not the only two books in the world, so I read other stuff. So I started to read some other books. I have started to read just The Charter House of Parma, because I felt like it, by Stendhal. For Caribbean, I started to read uh, Love, Anger, Madness, by Marie Vieux-Chauvet. And for um, Ancient Upon, I started to read The Aeneid by Virgil, translated by Robert Fagels. And at this one, I am at book, I finished book six, I am at the beginning of book seven, so I am exactly halfway through. Uh, for this one, I am, um, I am at page 314 out of almost 500, so I am about 60% uh, of the way through. And this one I am at about one third, so I have read 200 pages out of 600. And what these three books have in common is that they are very dense. They require a lot of brain. And this one also has the added um, difficulty, I guess, of being very serious and of being very... Um, uh, there's no word in English for that, anxiogène. Uh, so it's creating anxiety because it is about a dictatorship. It's about a place where everybody watches one another. It's a play, it's about uh, people getting killed right in the middle of the streets, it's about how terror works, basically. So it, I cannot read many pages of it at a time before I get very frustrated and because, before I get all sweaty and just basically just full of anxiety. So uh, because these books require a lot of brain power, I decided to put them on hold a couple of days ago and to read something a bit more fluffy, <laughs> something with a bit more air in it. 
and that is of course a romance and more precisely a historical romance. So I decided to go to one of my Georgia tires. I read These Old Shades. This one is set in 18th century Paris. Our protagonist is a 40 year old duke. He has no soul, he has no principles, he has no conscience, and he has an enemy. He's been ruminating a revenge for 20 years, and he still hasn't found a way to, hasn't found a way to get a proper revenge on his enemy. One night, when he's coming back from the brothel, the gambling house, his mistress perhaps, um, some, a young man, a boy, just bumps into him. And that boy, who is supposed to be 19, according to what he says, is trying to run away from his older brother, uh, who's about to beat him for basically no good reason. So this duke sees something in the face of that boy and decides to buy the boy from the older brother. Um, so the boy will work as a servant, as a page. And yeah, the, 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 the plot moves on from there. And I thought it was kind of nice, kind of lovely. There's a something that comes up at page 70 that I did not see coming, which is kind of, if you read the back of the book, I think eh, the, 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 what, the, the twist at page 70 is there, but I had not read the back of the book. So for me, it was a surprise and it was quite nice. So I'm not going to tell you what it is. Um, so I, I very much like this book. It, it, there's a romance in there, but it's almost a secondary uh, consideration to the um, the revenge story, I guess, to the mystery of who is this boy and uh, the origins of this boy. And uh, yeah, it, it's kind of like, it's a nice love story. Um, yeah, so so that I read that. And then I was still in the mood for fluff, so I read another fluffy thing. It's A Duke Undone by Joanna Lowell. Now, I, I, I shouldn't read two romances in a row because I guess it's just too much sugar. I never liked the second one as much as the first. Now, of course, I don't know if it's because the book is not as good or if it's just because it's two in a row and it's just too sweet. Um, this one is less sweet. Uh, th this one is completely sweet romance. There's absolutely no sex scene. It was written in 1920s, so it's, you get the values and you get, um, you, you get the, the, the principles and the proprieties of the 1920s. This one was written in the 2020s, so um, it, it's, it's, it's a bit more uh, crude, a bit more... Um, th there's explicit sex scenes in there, uh, there's the F word, and uh, there's uh, yeah, a few things like that that I didn't like as much. So this one is set in 19th century London in the 1880s. Uh, our main character is... Uh, the, the lady main character is a student at the art school, and one day uh, she's going to the art school and she stumbles a uh, um, completely naked man magnificent man and she decides to sketch him and that sketch becomes a painting um, and th that painting uh, becomes um, a bit of a bone of contention uh, because uh, the, the, the Duke, because of course the men, the naked men, the, the drunk, completely drunk and naked in a, in a very poor neighborhood of London is in fact a Duke. And that duke uh, is um, is not entirely free of his movements. He's not supposed to drink. He's not supposed to gamble. He's not supposed to do a whole bunch of things. Otherwise, he his fortune will remain um, administered by a third party. So, uh, so, so he has uh, he he must find the the painter of that painting, and that that is how they meet. And he wants to make sure that no other such painting will find its way in the public because he cannot have any any scandal attached to his name. Otherwise, he will basically lose. Uh, he will not necessarily lose his fortune, but he will lose um, the the power over his fortune, the power over his life, basically. So it's the story of how the, the, these two interact and how the, the Duke will find a way to get uh, full possession of his possessions, of his estate, of his uh, fortune, basically full possession of his life. So it, it's very interesting. It, it's fun. It's fun. Uh, but as I said, because it was a second hero for me, it was just perhaps a bit too much. Um, oh, and I forgot one. I forgot one. Oh, um, and I also read a play for Ancient Upon. So it was uh, The Miser by uh, Molière. Um, it's a classic. It, it was fun. Uh, I, it's a play that I've seen before, but I had never read it. So it's the first time that I'm reading it. And 
I don't have anything to say about it. <laughs> uh, it it's good. It's about a man who is a very uh, miserly, who, um, yeah, and he decides to marry a young woman. And of course, uh, this being Molière, Molière writes comedies, he writes farces. Um, so the, the young woman he wants to marry is, of course, in love with his son, and his son is in love with that young woman. And uh, he, for money, for financial reasons, he decides that his daughter will marry a friend of his uh, who is rich and is 60 years old. And of course, uh, the daughter does not want to marry the old man. She wants to marry uh, her, her sweetheart. And the sweetheart is masquerading as a, a servant of the miser because he wanted to sort of uh, get, get, get a foot in the place. Uh, and there's a, a bunch of uh, quid pro quos of uh, people masquerading as other people and pretending to be people they're not. Um, it's Molière, it's Molière, so it's well written and it, it, it's kind of funny, but uh, at the same time it's a comedy that perhaps did not age that well. Um, yeah, I think Molière is better, uh, I don't know. So it, it's a play, it's not bad. It's not, uh, it's not the most wonderful book I've ever read, but it's not bad. So, I think, oh no, no, I, I forgot another, <laughs> Return on the Range, I read Lucky Lou, so that was fun, that was not disappointing, I read that in the first week of June and that was not disappointing, so that, that one was good, <laughs> whoops, okay, that's it, I think that means, uh, yeah, I keep forgetting things and I'm dropping things, so I think that means it's time for me to end this video, <laughs> so uh, I will continue reading the books that I said that I was reading, so yeah, maybe at the end of the month I will have something more to say about these books, and meanwhile, I'm just going to say thank you for watching. I hope you're having great reads in June, and I will see you in the next video. À la prochaine!